Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you, uh, you are at this moment attending uh, this first webinar in, this in a series of webinars where um, the World Health Organization, and ISPA, the International Society for Physical Activity and Health, are collaborating um, on the new WHO guidelines on physical activity and sedentary behavior, and where we, where we will be focusing on translating science to practice. And uh, because this is a uh, collaboration with, uh, with the World Health Organization, um, I would like to, uh, to welcome Dr. Juana Williamson to say a few words on, uh, on behalf of the uh, WHO. Thank you very much, Jasper. And thank you to ISPA for making this opportunity for us to collaborate as WHO on this series of webinars that really are here to dig deeper into a number of different aspects of guidelines and the science behind the guidelines, but also how we put those guidelines into practice. So the really key parts of implementation of guidelines and promotion of physical activity. And I think we, we have certainly recognized that having guidelines is simply not enough. And really it's what we do next that matters if we're going to see people become more physically active. And a key element of that is communicating those guidelines to key stakeholders and to the general public. Communication campaigns are a cost-effective intervention. They're one of the NCD best buys put forward by WHO. But really, if we're going to see behavior change, those campaigns need to be sustained and they need to be tailored. And so really, it's with, with great pleasure to be working with ISPA and join today in hosting this webinar that's going to do exactly that, to explore the science behind messaging to hear a little bit more about what has been done recently, as well as to hear some experiences from on the ground and the challenges that we still face in promoting physical activity. And so with that, I'm, I'm gonna hand back to Jasper to introduce our first speaker and let's kick this webinar off to, to really understand much more about translating this science into practice and in particular for behavior change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juana. Yes, so what can you expect from us today? As Juana was saying, we have prepared a, uh, um, a webinar with, we think, four very good speakers from different parts of the world that will tell us about their experiences with uh, how guidelines can actually be used to change physical activity behavior. Um, and you can see uh, the speakers here, uh, and Juana and I will be moderating the speakers and moderating the questions and answers. And if you have questions and answers at any time during the presentations, uh, please use the question and answer button in the bottom of your Zoom screen. So um, I can see there have been some messages in the, the chat function, that's of course okay as well. But for questions, please use the, uh, the Q&A uh, function thing. And, um, also, what we uh, very much welcome, obviously, is um, engaging via social media. Uh, please remember to, uh, to use the hashtag EveryMoveCounts. That um, is the main hashtag for the, uh, for the new WHO guidelines. Uh, and we would be very happy, obviously, if you, uh, if you can tag us. So with those um, practical uh, parts, uh, out of the way, I would like to now not use more time on introductions uh, to what we're actually going to do, but now start with the important part, introducing our first speaker. We're very happy to have Chloe Williamson from the University of Edinburgh, where she is a, a PhD student. And um, Chloe has been working very much with um, how uh, physical activity guidelines and physical activity messaging can actually be done in practice, uh, has developed a framework for physical activity messaging, um, and I suspect we'll hear a lot more about her findings there. I'll stop sharing my screen now, Chloe, and you can share yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I'll just pull up my slides. 
Can everybody see them? Yep, you're good to go, Chloe. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me. So I'm hopefully going to be setting the scene today for this webinar and speaking a little bit about my research into physical activity messaging and sort of introducing how we might use mes messaging of the physical activity guidelines to try and encourage the public to be more active. So as researchers, healthcare professionals and policymakers in the field of physical activity for health, of course we know physical activity is good for health and we've known this for a long time. We now have a really solid body of evidence about the relationships between physical activity and various health outcomes. We gather all of this um, information we have and evidence we have and we develop um, physical activity guidelines like those from the World Health Organization or other national agencies like the UK CMOs. Um, so these are evidence based statements on epidemiological thresholds or the type and amount of physical activity that people should be doing for good health. But what's the purpose of physical activity guidelines? So in um, 2010, the World Health Organization outlined these specific purposes of the guidelines. And so among various other purposes, we can see that one of the functions is to raise awareness and knowledge of the health benefits of physical activity among different groups. But something that we have to consider is that the physical activity guidelines like those developed by the World Health Organization or other national health agencies are not intended to be public facing. We cannot expect these guidelines themselves to double up as effective communications about physical activity and they're not suitable for this purpose. So rather than trying to give the public information about physical activity in the way it is in the guidelines, we need to augment the guidelines with messages that are more suitable for public consumption. So physical activity messaging can be defined as the overall process of designing, creating and delivering physical activity messages and it's a subtype of wider health communication with a physical activity message being educational or persuasive material to be relayed to a specific individual or group with the ultimate aim of increasing physical activity levels. So there's a number of reasons that we're interested in physical activity messaging. The first is if we consider an ecological or a whole systems approach to targeting physical activity levels, um, we acknowledge that alongside physical environment changes and political approaches, we also have to target social and individual factors. So things like social norms, awareness, perceptions and attitudes, etc. And this is something that messaging can help with. And indeed, the importance of this approach is highlighted in ISPA's eight best investments that work for physical activity, with number five clearly including physical activity messaging. The second reason is that physical activity messaging is a scalable approach and it has the potential to reach a large number of people at a relatively low cost. And finally, and importantly, messaging can be used to augment the physical activity guidelines that we put so much effort into um, to make them more meaningful and digestible to the public. But how do we best go about messaging? So we started trying to answer this question by conducting a scope and review of physical activity messaging um, here's the abstract of that paper, which was published in Ijbenpa in April 2020. Um, and what we did was systematically scope out the literature around physical activity messaging. And we collated and summarized the evidence from 123 studies. So what I'm gonna do is present the headline findings relating to first the message content and secondly, the message delivery. So in terms of message content, and the evidence we reviewed showed that evidence on how much information does not support one amount over another. So what we mean by this is that there isn't evidence to support, for example, 150 minutes a week over five times 30 minutes a week over 10,000 steps, for example. The evidence also supported the use of practical advice or what we call how-to information in messages. The evidence um, supported gain-free messages, so messages highlighting the benefits of being active rather than the consequences of being inactive, and also supported the use of messages focusing on short-term benefits, especially relating to mental and social health outcomes rather than longer-term physical health outcomes. The evidence we reviewed supported the use of formative research with the target population and drawing on um, theory and social marketing principles in message development, and also in um, making messages targeted to specific groups rather than generic, so splitting up the population. In terms of message delivery, the evidence suggests that different groups have different preferred sources or messengers and delivery modes, unsurprisingly, 
The evidence also suggested that the general public may find guideline documents unappealing and that there may be a preference for more commercial style messages. The evidence also supported using multiple modes to get across the same message and working with local partnerships to provide opportunities for people to act on the messages that they see. So during the scope and review process, we identified a number of key points um, that formed a rationale for creating a conceptual framework specifically for physical activity messaging. So the first piece of rationale was that physical activity messaging is a complex and multidimensional area. We identified numerous concepts relating to physical activity messaging, and it's an area of growing interest. So almost half of the studies we found were from the past five years. We also found that to date, and to the best of our knowledge, there'd been no attempt to organize these key physical activity messaging concepts into a usable format. We also identified what we're calling a missing step, where the specific mechanisms of a message or the aims and specific outcomes beyond just to improve physical activity were not identified. And finally, we found a lack of um, use of format of research with the target audience and use of theory and message development with only 67% of the studies that we found in our um, review drawing on psychological theory to inform message development. So we did develop a physical activity messaging framework um, and that framework has these five aims. So firstly, the framework aims to comprehensively illustrate all of the important or common messaging concepts that may be taken into consideration when developing physical activity messages. The second aim is to harmonize the understanding of key physical activity messaging concepts and terminologies because these are used really inconsistently in the literature and it causes some confusion and makes it difficult to collate and summarize what we know. The framework also aims to encourage co-development with the target audience and use formative research theory and existing evidence in message development. The framework also aims to address this often missing step, so identifying specific aims and mechanisms of the message. And finally, we just want the framework to provide a useful and practical tool that can be used by anybody, academics, practitioners, and any other relevant stakeholder in developing physical activity messages. So we are now in the write up phase of a modified Delphi study, which had the aim of improving and developing this framework that we had been working on. And um, so we now have consensus on the framework. We reached consensus in the third survey round. So we now have 84% of agreement from an international expert panel um, of 40 people from academics, healthcare professionals, and other professionals, government officials, and policymakers from nine countries. So this is the physical activity messaging framework um, in a near final version. So there might be minor changes to wording and things like that, but this is the version that has consensus from the expert panel. And what I'm gonna do is just talk through the key principles of the framework and I'm happy to expand in the question and answer or um, an email afterwards, whichever works best. So as you can see, the framework is split into three overarching sections. The first is who, when, what, how, and why. Then we have the message content and the message delivery. The first section of the framework encourages the user to identify a target group um, and you can engage with them then throughout message development to identify the context of the message, the specific aims and outcomes beyond just improving physical activity levels and propose mechanisms by which a message might work. We also then have this why section that goes up the left-hand side and along the bottom of the framework, and that encourages the user to make decisions based on format of evaluation um, with the target audience, and to also draw on theory and existing evidence when making decisions about the message. The second section of the framework um, takes the user through a series of considerations relating to what's actually in the message, so the message content. So firstly, it's relating to the type of information that might be in the message. So this could be what to do um, information, so recommendations on quantity and type of physical activity, so such as the, the physical activity guidelines. Then we have why you should do it information. So that's information about the benefits um, or the consequences of activity or inactivity, or it could be how to do it information. So that's this practical and supportive information that we identified in the scope and review. It then asks the user to consider whether this information will be gain or loss framed, um, generic, targeted to a specific group or tailored to an individual even, and personalized or not. 
Finally, the framework encourages the user to consider the language and choice of words and to make sure that they're ethnically, culturally, contextually and age appropriate, for example, and also the tone of the message that would work best for the target audience and the aim of that specific message. Finally, the third section of the framework takes the user through some considerations about how that information might be conveyed. So will it use text, images or video or music? Um, also to consider the media mode or channel of the message delivery and um, what the volume or length of message delivery will be, who that provider source or messenger will be, the setting in which it will be delivered and the frequency time of day and duration. So the key aspect of this framework is that it's to be used sequentially. Um, so the decisions made in section one should always be used to inform the decisions made in sections two and three. So who the target audience is and what the specific aims of the message are should inform the decisions about content and delivery. So just to summarize um, my presentation, physical activity guidelines are not intended to be public facing and we can't expect them to double up as effective physical activity messages for the public. Physical activity messaging is a scalable approach that can be used um, to augment the physical activity guidelines, such as those from the World Health Organization, with messages that are more digestible and meaningful to the public, and therefore can target social norms and um, awareness perceptions toward physical activity. Emerging evidence supports the promotion of gain frame messages, focusing on specifically short term mental and social health benefits of physical activity rather than longer term physical health benefits and messaging uh, targeted to specific subgroups rather than genetic messages. And finally, we've developed a physical activity messaging framework um, which promotes firstly drawing on evidence, theory and formative evaluation with the target audience to establish specific aims and outcomes and potential mechanisms of a message and then using that information to inform message content and delivery. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Chloe, for that really clear and concise presentation on, on the work that you've been doing. Um, it, it's great to see that framework laid out and that, that's a really clear take home message, uh, I think for all of us. There's a couple of questions that have popped up in the Q&A. Um, there's a question from Richard English, just asking if you could maybe give some examples of commercial style messages. You mentioned that early on in your presentation. Um, and, and that maybe some of the differences, what the commercial world has done well and we haven't and what we need to learn from them. So this is something I'm definitely still learning about. Um, but my understanding is that the commercial style messages are what we would see more from marketing of other products, if you like, other than physical, physical, physical activity behavior. Um, so if we compare, for example, scientific outputs and even the slightly more user-friendly ones like the infographics that we produce, um, they're still very much, obviously we want our messages to be based in science, but we maybe don't want that to be on the surface of the message. And um, so we can sort of learn from social marketing and the approaches they use to maybe make our messages seem more like advertisements we'd see for other products um, that, we, that the public buy into on a daily basis. Thanks, Chloe. I think you're right. We, we've got probably quite a lot to learn from um, some of those very clever marketing techniques that, that are used. Um, another question here is um, whether you feel that even if we have really good tailored and targeted physical activity messages, um, with, we're still facing a barrier um, to within, within the system, people being more physically active. So can we still get behavior change even though we're not able to change maybe the whole the whole system in which pe we're asking to people to be more uh, physically active yeah so as much as i am very passionate about physical activity messaging and i'm doing a whole phd in it i i do acknowledge that physical activity messaging alone um, is not going to lead to behavior change that's unlikely itself but what it does do is play a role in a systems approach where if we target the individual and social factors through messaging, it might be more likely that person then takes up opportunity um, by using a cycle lane, for example. It's, it's a, a step along the way to encouraging the public to take up physical activity opportunities that are available to them. 
Great, thanks, Chloe. Uh, there's a whole barrage of questions coming in now. Um, I, I think in, in the interest of time and with respect to the other speakers, I'm not going to take those now, but we are keeping an eye on those questions and maybe they will come up during the um, Q&A session later. If not, I'm sure Chloe will try and have a look at some of those questions and if there are some you can answer. I know that people are asking where you're going to publish the paper, etc. Um, maybe you'll be able to answer those in the Q&A. Yes. Well, thanks very much, Chloe. Um, it, it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Jennifer Tomassoni from Queen's University in Canada. Um, she's been leading a, a whole program of research on closing that research to practice gap for physical activity behavior change. Uh, and in particular, she led the work on knowledge translation for the Canadian 24 hour movement guidelines for adults and older adults that were published last year. Um, I've had the great pleasure of working with Jen on some of these issues in the past. And so um, Jen, would you like to take the floor and share your slides with us, please? Hey, hi everyone. Hello from Canada. As Juana mentioned, my name is Jen and I was the knowledge translation lead for the 24 hour movement guidelines for adults. And I really want to thank ISPA and the WHO for including me in this awesome webinar today. I'm really pleased to be able to share the process that our team used to create our campaign messages and the public facing materials that accompanied the release of our guidelines. But before I go further, I'd like to acknowledge that the development and knowledge translation of the guidelines were funded by the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology, the Public Health Agency of Canada, Queen's University and Participaction. While I walk through how our team went from guidelines to messages, uh, just recognize that our work has lots of synergy with Chloe's physical activity messaging framework. And so you might hear some of the, the terms come up along the way and I'll loop back to this framework at the end. So if you haven't heard of the Canadian 24 hour movement guidelines for adults, as Juana mentioned, they were released last year in October and they provide recommendations for physical activity, sedentary behavior and sleep over a 24 hour period. We actually released two guidelines at once. Um, the first were for adults 18 to 64 years, which are shown here. And there's a second set for adults 65 years or older. When the guideline development team first met to discuss the impact that we wanted these guidelines to have, we recognized that previous Canadian physical activity and movement guidelines have been useful for the many reasons that Chloe had up on her slide earlier. But despite guideline availability and the substantial efforts that have gone into the mass media campaigns and the communication of the guidelines, what we see is that awareness is consistently low and our behavioral targets remain unmet. So this knowledge to practice gap is not unique to Canada. I'm sure many of us would see similar gaps in our countries um, and in guideline uptake worldwide. And so to bridge this gap, our team turned to the scientific discipline of knowledge translation or KT in order to improve awareness of the guidelines as well as ensure that people are making efforts towards meeting them. Now I know that the text in this framework here is small, but all the details about this process can be found in the publication listed at the bottom of the slide. But just briefly, we started out by operationalizing the knowledge to action framework for our purposes. And this framework became the blueprint for the steps and the research that we would systematically undertake to enhance our KT efforts for the guidelines. For this process, we used an integrated knowledge translation or IKT approach, whereby researchers and end users worked together at all phases of KT efforts so that we could enhance the relevancy and use of both the guidelines and the messages among Canadians. And so here is the KT team. It's comprised of representatives of the main funders and drivers of guideline knowledge translation. We have representatives from sleep and physical activity organizations, healthcare professional organizations, government and non-government organizations. We have members of the general public represented, KT researchers, then of course we need a coordinator to keep us all in line and several graduate student trainees. And so this team first met in June, 2019. So that's a year, almost a year and a half before the guidelines came out. 
We scrutinized previous guideline KT efforts in Canada and elsewhere, and we arrived at a really important decision that Canada needs to do better when it comes to sharing the guidelines with members of the general public. Traditionally, all guideline audiences from policymakers to health professionals to members of the general public have all received scientific documents that give the full wording of the guidelines. The behavioral thresholds or the guideline recommendations themselves have been the central focus in these materials. Now, while the thresholds are important, recent studies suggest that threshold messages are associated with more negative perceptions of the guidelines among the general public and that these threshold messages are off-putting to individuals who do not meet the thresholds themselves. And we know that that is the majority of the Canadian population. So we envisioned public facing materials that could represent the guideline recommendations more generally without the thresholds in a way that is understandable to the general public. These messages could be crafted for a reading level of grade six or seven, so at about an age 12 level, include small simple words and descriptions and utilize action words to make the materials clear and concise. Literature tells us that generic messages have the potential to highlight that health is possible at any level of engagement. They're theorized to be more realistic and understandable by the general population, and thus people may be more likely to change their behavior following uh, seeing the message. We undertook a series of formative research studies to inform our public facing materials. So first, in partnership with Participaction, we surveyed a representative sample of over 1,000 Canadian adults and asked them how they would like to receive information about the guidelines. We learned that adults want practical examples and instructions about the behavior, that they prefer generic messages compared to threshold messages, and that they look to diverse communication channels to receive this information. So everything from social media to websites and all the way to their health professionals. Next, my student Emma Fott surveyed nearly 900 Canadian stakeholders who may use the guidelines in their professional work. We asked them for feedback about the draft of the guidelines and their opinion on messaging strategies for the general public. We learned that stakeholders believe that the guidelines need to be translated into simpler language and include practical examples wherever possible. They believed that generic message, messages would elicit, elicit greater self-efficacy among the general public for meeting the guidelines. And they suggested that we use a message around a whole day matters. My master's student, Alexandra Walters, then went ahead to experimentally test the impact of generic messages on 250 Canadian adults' self-efficacy to meet the guidelines. We found that repeated exposure to messages was important for message recall. And we also found that compared to threshold messages, generic messages elicited the greatest self-efficacy to meet the guidelines among the adults who were the least active. In consultation with our KT team and the guideline development panel, we discussed the findings and how to integrate them into public facing materials. Participation staff and graphic designers made our research findings and idea come to life in a series of mock-ups, which were then brought forward for feedback again. And so after an iterative process of consultation through webinars and emails over a period of six months, the result was a suite of public facing materials. A single poster was designed first. The symbol of a clock represents the entire 20, it represents that the entire 24 hour period is important. The overlapping circles are a visual reminder of the approximate proportion of time to spend on each of the three behaviors throughout the day. You'll see that two generic taglines are included, make your whole day matter and move more, reduce sedentary time, sleep well. In line with our research findings, the behavioral thresholds were not included. The icons you see representing the three behaviors as well as the clock are carried out throughout all of our public facing materials. A series of infographics has also been developed to provide some more specifics for both age groups of adults. We have a set of infographics about the physical, mental and social benefits of striving to meet the guidelines, as well as a set of infographics that provides the thresholds but in a more digestible format than the scientific guideline documents. The third infographic addresses our research finding that indicated Canadians want practical tips for how to meet the guidelines. 
Because our findings suggested that we should use diverse communication channels, we also prepared a series of social media posts along with associated graphics and suggested hashtags and links. So I'm showing two examples here, but there are six in total and they were formatted to be shared on various social media platforms. Our KT team packaged the suite of public facing materials into a dissemination or communications toolkit, which was shared with all stakeholders involved in the guideline initiative. Stakeholders were encouraged to share the contents or the entirety of the toolkit with their network. And we posted the toolkit on the CSEP and participation websites to ensure broad access to all audiences. And so now I'll unpack how the process we used in Canada connects to Chloe's physical activity messaging framework. So first, we engaged a multidisciplinary group of stakeholders and end users in our message development process. This group contributed to shaping the formative research that we undertook, selecting the populations of interest, interpreting the research finding, and provided rounds of feedback on our materials. An important criteria for decision making throughout this process was ensuring equity in all of our efforts. We considered that our materials were being released during the pandemic, so all images and examples provided in our materials reflect the notion of the public health countermeasures that are in place. But we chose not to make explicit mention of COVID so that the materials will resonate beyond the pandemic. We targeted the determinant of self-efficacy to meet the guidelines and based our messages on previous literature as well as formative research about preferences and needs of our target audience. We designed a variety of public facing materials that provide the recommendations, the benefits of meeting the recommendations and tips for how to do so. All of our, our, all of our materials offer gain frame generic messages that are targeted to either 18, adults 18 to 64 years or adults 18, 65 plus years. Given the large diversity and population across Canada, it was impossible for us to personalize the materials, but they were tailored. We pilot tested our taglines to ensure that the language and tone used would be appropriate for a broad sample of Canadians. Our messages are conveyed using both text and images. We tried to minimize text volume wherever possible, and we purposely designed a toolkit with materials in multiple formats. And finally, while our toolkit does offer recommendations for how, when, and where the materials can be used, ultimately the materials will be used in a way that works for the person or organization who picks them up and uses them. So as Chloe mentioned, one of the key goals of messaging is increasing awareness about the guidelines. And so we did, a, a, I'm presenting some evaluation data here that we um, conducted with participation. My PhD student, Caitlin Caulfield collected data up, um, from about 1500 Canadian adults and asked them about their awareness of the 24 hour movement guidelines one week before their launch and one month following the launch. So this preliminary analysis shows that 8% of Canadian adults said that they were very or somewhat familiar with the guidelines before they came out, which is not that surprising because there was a little bit of promotional mater material that came out before the launch. However, that 8% jumped to only 16% following our substantive mass media and communications campaign. And so while this data is promising that our efforts have achieved, achieved a given level of guideline awareness soon after the guideline launch, it also highlights that this messaging, that these messaging and communication campaigns need to be part of a broader effort. And so we know that guideline awareness is an antecedent of guideline behavior, but it's several steps removed. So if you consider Maguire's hierarchy of effects model, Exposure to the guideline message operates at the top. Someone must be exposed to the guideline to be aware of its existence or exposed to the message about the guideline to know about the guideline. And then with some cognitive processing, they can then understand or know what they, how they should be acting. But from there, there are several steps required before behavior in line with the guidelines can be enacted. My team's recent systematic scoping review of the literature confirms that we need different strategies to target these different outcomes. Dissemination strategies or communication strategies will at best change the outcomes at the top of this model, 
And so we can't expect to change behaviors with guideline messaging alone. To change the determinants that are more proximal to behavior as well as behavior itself, we must use implementation strategies such as programs and policy changes. And so our Canadian KT team is continuing to execute and evaluate our communication campaign so that we can further build awareness of the new guidelines. We are also planning implementation efforts to ensure that we can move Canadian adults to actually meet the guideline recommendations. Thanks so much for listening and I'm really looking forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Jen, for taking us through what, what I know was an enormous um, piece of work that really brought together a very diverse group. And, and I congratulate you on the work that you and your group did to come up with these great materials um, that were launched at the same time as the guidelines. There have there've been a couple of questions that have come up. Um, um, let me see if I can pick just one one or two quickly for you before I pass on to Valentina, if you don't mind. Um, so one here from Alison Crozier, how do the 24 hour guidelines impact Canadians perceptions of whether physical activity is the norm? Um, I don't. Hmm. Do you think right. just having those those new guidelines is, is and having them hmm. out there in the public realm is really changing how people feel about physical activity as, as being a norm? Um, it's a really great question. I think what we're seeing from some of the media coverage that we've had and, and just in talking um, to our stakeholders and to, to members of the general public is that they're appreciating um, understanding that physical activity is part of their day and that it's not this additional task that they have to find time to do. Um, and so the 24 hour movement guidelines are trying to change the way people are thinking it, about making the most of their time as opposed to adding physical activity to their day. Um, we've never, we haven't evaluated norms, but that is definitely, um, it would be, it would be it's the next study. One of my grad students will get on it. <laughs> I think I think the other thing we, we all need to recognize is that both the Canadian guidelines and the WHO guidelines came out in quite an exceptional year where maybe the norm doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, there's just one question here from, from Ben Grieve. Uh, do you think there's a time when a threatening tone for a message would be appropriate? Mm. Would there be a demographic that might respond well to that? Oh, interesting. Um, well, what we know from the literature, and Chloe um, found this in her scoping review as well, is the idea of a gain frame message. So focusing on the benefits of engaging in the behavior as opposed to the negative consequences of not engaging in the behavior and that that seems to resonate um, more often um, with the general population. There, interestingly, um, there is some research in disability, specifically spinal cord injury, that suggests the opposite um, effect exists there, um, but I, I think that that literature is in its infancy. And so for now, standard practice, cause no harm, gain framed messages is likely the way to go. Great, thank you so much, Jen. Um, I wonder if I could now um, just introduce uh, Valentina. So Valentina Ochoa from Mexico, uh, she's been working with an NGO implementing projects that really involve citizen participation in promoting physical activity, um, particularly for NCD prevention. Um, she's authored a report on physical inactivity in Mexico, uh, and we were very pleased to have her as part of the WHO webinar for the launch of the guidelines, where she spoke, um, she spoke also about the difficulties of promoting physical activity uh, in Mexico and in that particular setting. So we're very happy to welcome Valentina. Uh, we've asked her just to share some of her experience from on the ground um, in supporting civil society organizations and addressing some of these barriers to physical activity that we've heard about, and especially in, in a country with a very high NCD burden, such as Mexico. So Valentina, if you could just share some of your experiences with us. Yes, thank you very much for having me uh, here. 
Juana, yes, um, it I will be happy to share with you some of our experience. We are an NGO and we work in different topics, among them road safety, tobacco, and physical activity. All of them involve a certain degree of trying to change the behavior. And most of our projects take place on the street. It's about implementing them. So uh, for this uh, webinar, I thought it would be a good idea to talk about an example of a project uh, we implemented in a, in a city, in a small city here in Mexico that had uh, two specific components about uh, uh, road safety mainly and about uh, physical activity. I, I thought that this comparison may be good because uh, I think when we talk about road safety and physical activity, we have very much similarities. In one way, we have like all the evidence that supports all the policies that need to take change, but we also have uh, at the same time uh, challenges to this. So uh, in the WHO webinar that we have, we talk about some of these uh, challenges that I would like to um, use here and uh, take you through these examples. So the, the, the example I want to give you is that we tried to make an intervention around the schools. So we, can, uh, we will provide the kids a safer environment for them to go to schools. So this uh, city had a very high index of uh, children fatalities regarding road safety, but it was a very important component of these interventions to promote uh, that children will keep walking, cycling, or taking public transport to school. Because of, as Juana said, the highly uh, rates of uh, non-communicable diseases that we have in Mexico, and also the very high um, index of obesity we have in children. So for this, uh, we needed to make a redesign of the street. And I think this is very important because when we talk about real challenges, trying to change the behavior of people is that uh, we are sure we need a systematic approach that can address the different uh, these different challenges. We have the, the culture, the preconceptions uh, as, as a challenge. We have the people, we, we tend to think that people are very smart and they will uh, understand what we are trying to do. But we also have a background that may not allow us to, um, to make these changes in our day to life in our day to life so easily. We have also sometimes that public policies do not uh, that are already taking place may not uh, cover what we are trying to do, and also the environment, the infrastructure. Is the infrastructure in a city really allowing us to make changes in our behavior? To, uh, do we have enough, uh, enough lighting for women to go walking or to go cycling at night? So in this intervention, we had to do a pedestrian cross uh, along a most, um, a, 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 along a lane that was very of high of very high speed for the for the cars. So we talked to parents and we talked to children, telling them what we why it was important to keep uh, children walking to school and why it was important for cars to reduce the speed when in the cross between the school and the bus stop. So what we found here is that people were understanding the message, but they were not really so convinced about them. And I think this makes a very strong connection with what uh, Chloe mentioned. It was just after the intervention was done that we changed and redesigned the street that people began to notice how they can walk easier in the street, how they can, uh, how they were able to take the bus and then ride also to the to the school, and that's when parents and um, and also children were so convinced because they say, like before, it took me ten minutes that I was just standing by in the cross to make over the other way. So now they were able, because the cars were going slower, they were able to cross and walk from the bus stop and cross all the way in an easier uh, and safer way. So I think what Chloe said about people 
um, concentrating in what the result more near in time and not in a so long term is very important uh, for, for people to show uh, the benefits. And I think the guidelines help us, especially when we talk about political will, because the debate has been won, as Chloe said, the evidence, and as Jen said, all the, there, there is an agreement about the importance and the benefits. So we can, can now from civil society make a, a, a pressure to the political and force the political will to do this kind of, uh, of, of policies that impact in the activity, in the physical activity of the general uh, populations. I think also the guidelines, and um, this is something that may need further discussion, also allow us to protect the projects that are being implemented and to take legal actions as a right to the city and as a right to have a healthy life, especially for people with non-communicable diseases or that are um, vulnerable uh, users of the of the city. I, I think uh, Juana, that's an, an, an specific example that I hopefully will be useful. That's great, Valentina. Thank you so much for sharing that example with us. And I, I think you've You've so nicely brought together the the concepts that have been covered so far that you know the importance of of really tailored communication to your target group, but you've also highlighted I think Jen's last point that that the communications and the messaging isn't enough and we need to do much more at the implementation end as well, exactly. which I think is a great segue. I'm going to pass back to Jasper to introduce our next speaker. Um, Jasper. Thank you very much, Juana. Thank you very much, uh, Valentina, uh, Chloe, and Jen for your uh, your great uh, presentations. Um, our next presenter, uh, Adrian Bauman, uh, emeritus professor at the University of Sydney, uh, probably one of the most experienced scientists in this field, uh, and now, um, as he explained to me, uh, being able to uh, to actually do the projects he uh, he really likes. So uh, we're very happy. Uh, that Adrian um, was willing to get up early uh, in Australia and join us today. Adrian, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, and I'll share my screen. Um, okay. Good morning, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be with you to talk about one of my favorite areas of uh, research and thinking which are physical activity guidelines and how we communicate them. I've been thinking about this for a long time and I'm going to talk about the practice, the science and the policy. So I hope to give you a little bit of uh, a reflection on 30 years of actually working with guidelines and with their translation. Guidelines are useful because we use them for communicating evidence, for understanding the evidence, reporting on the evidence, defining the minimum physical activity threshold. And although the community doesn't love thresholds, as Chloe and Jen pointed out, policymakers love thresholds because it can be defined as targets that you can achieve. And guidelines are summarizing the evidence in simple message-friendly distillations. So this is an important use of guidelines. We've got a long history of health-related guidelines dating back to the 1980s. The 1995 and 96 half hour concept and moderate physical activity. We've refined the evidence further, added strength, balance, sedentary time, and we've got most recent guidelines. We're also mentioned in non health documents where sometimes physical activity guidelines exist in UN documents, in the SDGs, in transport, sport, education, and other sectors. The function of physical activity guidelines is different in high income countries compared to low and middle income countries. In high income countries, we repeat and update the guidelines every five years or 10 years. In low middle income countries, we bring physical activity to the attention of health personnel, policymakers, health professionals, governments, and we remind them that physical activity is important, sometimes for the first time, sometimes a reminder. So in high income countries, it's a repeated action 
And in low and middle income countries, it's really important to focus on physical activity. It's an entry point for clear discussion. Physical activity guidelines need to be distilled as a simple message. They're communications for different kinds of community campaigns. They're a launch for a national plan. They're, they're to inform professionals and they're also to inform people working outside of health that we've got a message. I wrote this slide perhaps 20 years ago about what a country should do for guidelines. Starting with number one, how's it relevant locally? What's the local context for your guideline? What, who are your target audiences or are you doing a mainstream whole population? Do your formative testing. Define the campaign and communication channels. Develop your campaign to everybody and to targeted groups, professionals, special population groups, older adults, people with disabilities. Um, define your special population groups. Link your campaign to your national plan implementation and monitor what you're doing. And we'll talk about this in terms of evaluating guideline recognition, understanding and adoption in practice and in policy. Guidelines exist through the developments in GAPA and are strongly linked to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and really the new WH targets aim for a 15% reduction in physical inactivity by 2030. The perennial problem we have is how to change the population prevalence of physical activity. And many countries show a relatively flat line over time, as shown here. But the challenging question is, what effect on population prevalence is a positive change? How much trend do you expect over five, 10 or 20 years? What's the time scale you need? And how will you maintain a standardized surveillance system to tell if you've actually changed physical activity? That's a, it's a side question, but it's an important one. So what do physical activity guidelines provide? They provide a message for communication and in low middle income countries in particular for advocacy to say physical activity is important. Here's new national global WHO guidelines that determine, define how much you need for what health benefits, for what non-health benefits you might get. Guidelines provide thresholds for clinicians and for public health guidance separately, but they, they, they overlap. And they're also an evidence base to bring people on board with recommending physical activity. We tend to lose track of physical activity's importance and guidelines refresh that thinking. The mass media pick it up, social media picks it up and governments get interested. Usually what we do with guidelines is we disseminate them as professional guidance with a public communication campaign, usually a small one and some kind of launch event. That's just not good enough. What we really need to do is integrate and link the communications to the country level national physical activity plan or the physical activity strategies in your region. So the guidelines become part of a comprehensive approach. They aren't looked at in isolation. GAPA, the Global Action Plan of WHO talks about campaigns. One, communications campaigns linked with community programs. Two, to increase understanding of the benefits and co-benefits of physical activity on air quality, on road traffic, on congestion, on urban development and urban form. Next, to implement initiatives and train health professionals. So all the communication pieces in GAPA Action 1.1 to 1.4 say we develop mass campaigns to communicate the physical activity guidelines. And it's also in ISPA's eight best investments. Guidelines are a simple message. The first step is developing the campaign and then followed by all the other things that we need to do. The campaign alone will only increase awareness of the guidelines. They won't actually ever change behavior. So physical activity guidelines by themselves do not generate behavior in the population. What they do are three kinds of things. One is to increase community awareness, understanding, change social norms, how people think about movement in the general population and importantly in disadvantaged populations and in special groups, in people with disabilities, 
in older adults? What do they think physical activity means in your country and how can that be influenced? How can we engage professionals with physical activity more? Starting with health professionals, but moving on to non-health sectors which have an engagement in physical activity, such as education, urban planning, sport. We also increase government interest. And if we achieve these intermediate things, we may have a chance of getting to changing physical activity prevalence over time. But does anyone actually interpret physical activity guidelines as communication and implementation of best practice programs? And I found only one example, and you may have others, and I'd be fascinated to hear about them. But the one example I did find was from Germany, because the German physical activity guidelines, the national ones, also included the recommended actions, the strategies and programs that are needed to actually implement the guidelines across settings, sectors, agencies, and types of programs. So they developed some recommendation documents, and some of these are published in English, and then a, back, <clears throat> a background document in German, which I can't read either, but it describes a working group, a literature search, a consultation, and 66 recommended interventions as the basis for physical activity promotion. So it links the guidelines to the national strategy and its implementation. And I think that's a very good thing. There may well be other countries that also use this approach because I think it's more than just the guidelines and their communication in isolation. So to conclude, I've got three slides. Don't just redevelop physical activity guidelines every five to 10 years. We need to develop and implement them properly before we get on to the next iteration. We use them for advocacy in low middle income countries to get physical activity on the agenda and get consideration even from, from non-health sectors as well as health. We've heard from Chloe and Jen about the simple clear messages and it's really gotta be very distilled. You can't have a guideline for every health outcome because then it would be a messy message. It's gotta be clear and relevant to the population you're talking to, to the disadvantaged group or the group of migrant populations or the group of older adults or for your country, what does physical activity mean? And you use your national plan to build on the guidelines to implement your system-based approach over time. And you need to have a good time frame, which is years, not months. So we need to you know, not just reinvent the guidelines, we need to be doing more than that. It's also important not to change the physical activity message too often. In the mid 1990s, the National Institute of Medicine in the US temporarily decided that the recommended physical activity amount for health should be 60 minutes a day. And this confuses the general population. So you've got to actually stick to guidelines for a long time and be very clear that that's what you need to do. Otherwise, the message will be, well, GPs, primary care physicians and people in primary care takes a long time for guidelines to disseminate into their practice. And you can't keep on changing the message. If the science changes in minute ways, you've still got to stick to the most pragmatic interpretation. So thank you to WHO and GAPA and ISPA for showing the way forwards. Note that the actual message hasn't changed that much. These are two campaigns more than 20 years apart, which are still saying move for more than 30 minutes a day. So we're not actually having major changes to the message to so stay on message, but it's now up to countries and regions to implement your best practice using the physical activity guidelines, but only as a means to a greater end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. That was a really um, good overview of the many, many things that have been happening with physical activity guidelines over the past many years. With that, um, we come to the end of our presentations, which means that we now have time for a more elaborate discussion with all of our speakers. And I think what we have heard from all of our speakers is that physical activity guidelines are a very important start of changing physical activity behavior. But we've also heard, and um, specifically Adrian was saying very much, they 
They don't change behavior on their own, not at all. They're the start. Um, so we have, as, as I explained before, the, the main questions will be posted through the, the Q&A. And we have a number of questions there. Um, and one of the, um, one of the questions uh, posted by, uh, by Aaron Hip is related to the focusing that we've seen on in these presentations is very much sort of about the general public and how we communicate to them to try and change behavior, which is obviously the end goal of uh, our physical activity guidelines. But how about communication to policymakers, to practitioners, to sort of all these potentially change agents that can help us achieve our messages. Are there any of our speakers that would like to, um, to respond to that? And perhaps while I can uh, um, speak to you, yeah, feel free to, to turn your cameras back on. I think we, uh, we have enough bandwidth to do that right now. And I can see Adrian, you've turned your microphone on. Would you like to respond? I've often thought for many years, and people don't like me saying this, is it's easier to change the general population's behavior than to change the behavior of health professionals and sometimes of policymakers. So that question is very incisive because we need to have campaigns that target policymakers, not just targeting the general community with a message. We need to actually get in there and argue in the debate with tobacco and obesity that physical activity is as important. And that's something we haven't done and we don't do as well. That's, I, I think many of us are nodding uh, re in, in recognition to that. Um, any of the other uh, speakers that have tried to do this or have ideas of how you could actually do this? So what, what type of messaging should we try to, to have to policymakers? Uh, Valentina, I saw you were reacting. Yes, so uh, we talk uh, very often to policymakers in our line of work, trying to convince them about different uh, matters between them, uh, physical activities. And I think one of the main challenges when you are talking to stakeholders or policymakers is that they think they are listening to, ma to the majority of the people because you are not the only one talking to them. I mean, they hear some kind of people. So I think what is very important about this presentation and what Chloe said and what Jen said is that it's also very important that the guidelines are used to give voice to the people that we want our campaign to be heard by our stakeholders. That not just the stakeholders listen to the people that are opposing to what we want, but that they also feel the social pressure of the people and that we're giving voice to the people that we want to be heard. And I think the guidelines do a very good work in giving uh, these um, strategic messages for people that are not often listened, like women, children, people with disabilities or with NCDs. So, so you're almost saying, Valentina, that by targeting the, the, the general public first and giving them the tools, we can then also use them and work with the general public to help convince policymakers. Is that what yes. you're saying? Yes, you need how, to do both of them. How, how, how do you, the, the other speakers, how do you think about that? What are your experiences there? I see Adrian nodding. Jen, you, you have experiences with this from Canada? Yes, um, it's a really great question. And my head goes straight to, uh, we were strategic when we assembled the team that be, would be responsible for knowledge translation of the guidelines. And we purposely aimed to get policymakers um, from different sectors involved. So we have the director of policy from the Canadian Medical Association on our team so that there would be ownership over what we were doing and their insight could inform what we were doing, which would then give that person sort of, you know, the, the boost that they needed to then share it within their organization and to start to foster change within their organization. That's one example. We also have the Public Health Agency of Canada as part of our stakeholder group that um, approves all the decisions and works with us in, in how we're 
navigating both communication and implementation. Um, but I can tell you that it's actually been super challenging to engage policymakers at a higher level in the middle of a pandemic because there are other pressing factors, um, which you know, physical activity is never really at the forefront, but especially now when um, COVID-19 is sort of taking, taking the, the show away. And so um, even though we have these stakeholders and they are engaged, it is challenging to get them to, to actually make moves. Um, so we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed for, for post-COVID that the benefit of engaging them throughout the process will pay off. I think that's definitely something to uh, to oops, to work on very much. Is it something, Chloe? Is it something that you, when you were developing your uh, your framework and your your scoping review, is it something that you've been looking into? What sort of type of messaging there people have been doing? Has uh, is there literature on this already? So my scoping review was limited to messages targeted to public populations rather than professional populations. And I have tried to address expanding that by including um, professional and healthcare professionals and other professionals and government officials in the Delphi study to try and get insights there. Um, but yeah, there's definitely less literature on that, I think. And I am less equipped to speak to it than the other speakers, I think, because I have very limited experience in that sort of thing. It, it, it might be a good topic for a, for a next uh, review, I think, to see, because I think it is an area where we, I think, have relatively little knowledge. OK, I want to slightly change topic to some of the other questions that I see posted in the Q&A. And I see there are two of them that are related to, um, to some of the things that Adrian was talking about, but also to a certain extent you were mentioning that, Valentina, is that um, we, we need to probably need to do quite different things with the guidelines, depending on if we are in a high income country or in a low income country. Um, and is there any sort of specific strategies or specific things that we need to be thinking about when we are talking about guidelines and how we can use them in a low income country um, to change physical activity behavior? Valentina or Adrian, ideas, thoughts? Physical activity is not an off the shelf product. It needs to be adapted locally to what it means in each low middle income country what the opportunities are and potential, what your national strategy and national plan are, and then link that to your physical activity guidelines. You also need to translate the message into your culture or multiple cultures in each country so that the message has meaning for the population and each of the key audience segments that you're targeting. And that's absolutely a necessary step. It's not an off the shelf that you just take it and translate it into your language, and then you have the guidelines. It's a bit of work, as is your national physical activity plan to which it should be linked. Definitely. Valentina, do you want to, to add a few perspectives from, from Mexico? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that uh, what is very important about what uh, about this question is that there is there is no question about the amount of time or the amount of, uh, of uh, a physical activity you need to do. I mean, that is universal. But what you need to take care of when you are uh, doing this is that, for example, in low income countries and all middle income countries, people move more for necessity than rather for the benefit and for joy. So the message cannot be the same in like in high income countries because the possibilities are not the same and what um Adrian was saying is that it's very important that when uh, stakeholders are working in the policies that they consider what needs to be done. I was uh, making the example, if we want women to keep on walking, well, safety is a very strong issue in middle income or low middle income countries. You as a woman may not be able to walk or cycle safely to the park or to school. You don't go to the park at night because of the insecurity your country may be living. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a very good point. Uh, and, and as you were also saying, the context of physical activity is important and very different, obviously, and especially some of the things that became clear when gathering the evidence for the new guidelines was that um, the evidence for um, if 
all physical activity is good, regardless of the context it is happening in, it is not that clear. Um, some studies say that work-related physical activity might in some cases actually not be a good thing. Um, so there, it's again, it's one of those areas where more evidence is needed and where I think the, yeah, making sure that we moving forward have enough data also from low and middle income countries is, uh, is very crucial. Um, one of the other questions I can see here from, uh, from Wendy Brown in the, uh, the Q&A um, has to do with the, the thresholds that are mentioned. And, and as Adrian was also saying, it's important if that we think about, is it 30 minutes, is it 60 minutes, is it 150 minutes per week, is it 150 to 300 minutes a week? What is it actually that we are talking about and how, how easy is it to message a, a range? Any suggestions or comments on that? Do we need a simple number? Do we need to assign it to someone, anyone who dares to comment? How, how, how did you do this in Canada, Jennifer? When you were looking at this, messaging this. Sure, so our previous um, Canadian physical activity guidelines did have the threshold of, a, of at least 150 minutes a week. Um, and so as Adrian mentioned, it's important to almost keep that message consistent over time to not confuse people. And so that is why we kept the threshold of 150 minutes and the, the emerging evidence was consistent with, with that um, as well. Um, but some of the other recommendations are a range in our guidelines. So sleep is seven to nine hours of sleep for adults and seven to eight hours of sleep for adults older the over the age of 65. Um, and so to keep it simple, we tend to say like at least seven hours of sleep in, in some of our materials um, so that there is sort of a cut point. Now, what is going to make it really challenging for surveillance of our guidelines is the fact that we do have um, ranges and what counts as meeting or not meeting the guidelines um, is going to be a little bit tricky. And the fact that there are so many behaviors makes it tricky as well. Um, so I'm not really sure if I answered the question other than I, I, I think that, you know, giving people sort of like the line in the sand is usually what they're looking for. I know healthcare professionals like a line in the sand because they want to know what to be able to tell their patients, you know, reach for this number. And then it's easier to monitor and easier for them to remember than a range. Um, but that doesn't mean that ranges are, are a bad thing. Um, maybe I'll pass it to Adrian. I saw that he wanted to poke in there. Mm -hmm. It's more complicated for sleep. You've got a U-shaped function. So you're actually trying to describe that. So you have to use a range. The range for physical activity, the minimum is still 150 minutes. So it's backwards comparable and you can still assess it over surveillance over many years. And you're putting an upper limit of 300 minutes mostly. So you don't think people, it's a linear and in, and in the benefit increases forever. And you're saying, really it, it maxes out at an hour and a bit a day and there isn't a need to do much more than that. And that's useful for people and professionals to know because some gym junkies, young enthusiastic people will come in and say, I'm doing four hours a day, am I getting great benefit? And the answer is they aren't. And that's actually putting a cap on that. So that's why that's done, but the minimum is still consistent and it's backwards and forwards comparable. So it is very much the line in the sand, the minimum numbers, that is, those are the important ones we need to communicate. That's at least what I'm hearing you, uh, you say. Okay, I'm looking at the, uh, at the Q and A. Um, it's, it's hard to keep track of, both of listening to what all of you are saying and trying to keep track of the, uh, the Q and A at the same time. Um, let me have a look here. Um, So um, one of the, the, um, the questions here um, is about the, the message to stakeholders and the public. So we've, we've been talking about this a little bit before, sort of what are we telling to the policymakers versus what are we telling to, um, to the general public? Are, is the uh, 150 minute per week, is that a message that we're also using to convince our policymakers or our planners or what, what message do we have there? Um, any comments or suggestions on that? 
Uh, I think that when we talk to policymakers, you you need to know what they want to listen and what will will they be, what will be more useful for them. So sometimes to highlighting the benefits may be enough useful. Also, we, we always try to back it up with evidence because they need to know for sure that what they are pushing for and the decisions they are taking and in, are in the best interest of the nation of or the community or whatever. And I think that another uh, important message that uh, besides the benefits in health is also the economy benefits, especially for policymakers that uh, work in things related to economy. So the, the cost of that lack or, 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 or of, of physical activity or sedentary behavior, how much does it cost to the state? And what are the benefits that you can um, take from them and how they can use the money for other sub sort of things is some of the of, of the key messages to the stakeholders. Things that the general population may not need to know or is irrelevant to them because uh, what has happened to us in some other cases is that when you highlight the benefits, the economical benefits, people say that I'm not going to see that money ever. So I, I, it doesn't, I don't care if they are saving that money. Uh, and, and I think you're again um, touching on one of the, the, the subjects where we know there is some evidence, we have some numbers of what it actually is we have in, in, in savings or in benefits from increasing physical activity, but a lot more research is needed because as you're saying, this is the type of information that a lot of policymakers want to have. Um, any of the other speakers want to comment on this or should, can I move on to another? topic that I saw mentioned in the Q&A and I thought was very interesting and move on. So one of the things Natalie Smith is asking here um, is the wording that we are using in our uh, guidelines. And she's asking about physical activity versus exercise. Are they the same? Are they interchangeable? But I think we can take the question a little bit broader and about sort of the, the messages that we are sending with the wording that we are choosing. Um, sit less is something that we heard um, a couple of years ago. It's sort of disappearing. There are good reasons for that. How important is the, the, the actual words that we are using and, and what are your experiences or recommendations for which words we should use? Adrian. It's culturally specific in many high-income countries, the population is used to the term physical activity for encompassing exercise, sport, active travel, active recreation, and even work. And they get the idea because we've been on the case messaging that for 15 or 20 years. In many middle and low-income countries, the concept is still exercise. Even in, in some high-income, the con concept can still be exercise. So you need to do your formative research find out what the meanings of physical activity are and use the words that the people are using to describe the things and behaviors that we want to portray. That, 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 that's an easy um, thing to say, Adrian. So I'm, I'm gonna play directly on that. So when we say do more physical activity, do people know what to do? Not in middle African countries or in Southeast Asia, they don't because they walk everywhere because with lots of people not having motorized vehicles, walking is a common way of getting to places. So they don't actually understand that what they're doing is already activity. So we need to give that a new word or reframe the concept for that local setting. So the message is the translation of the guideline into a locally interpretable message that makes sense. So is that with that, are you then also suggesting that while having these the, the guidelines from the WHO uh, hopefully reduces the need for a lot of countries to, to develop their own guidelines, which obviously is a lot of work and perhaps not really necessary. But what you're saying, or at least what I think you're saying, is they need to be locally adapted and going from these guidelines that might be very universal across many, many countries to messages that can be understood locally. Don't waste time 
reinventing the evidence because the evidence distillations done by WHO, done in England, done in the US are as comprehensive as you could ever get. Don't do it again. It's not necessary for five to 10 years or more. Get on with the adaptation, the meaning, the translation and the implementation. That's where countries should spend their efforts. We don't need any more 53 countries with new guidelines to say, look how well we're doing against GAPA. It's not good enough. Thank you very much for that, Adrian. I think with that, um, we have a very good tag to uh, to go uh, and hear uh, Juana from WHO um, with some reflections on what we've heard today, both from our speakers, but also here in our discussion uh, and from our questions. Juana. Thanks very much, Jasper. And I think Adrian finished that beautifully with, with a great segue to, to the work that we're trying to do um, and, and We've been involving various different groups, including including Jen and some of the people that she's been working with. And exactly that. We've reviewed the evidence. We've done that hard bit with the science. The next step is the really important part. And so we're working very hard to encourage countries to adopt the WHO guidelines and put their effort in that next bit, which, as we've heard, is really challenging. It's, it's figuring out how to get these messages across to policymakers, whether you need to talk about the finance, financial side, the, the gains that will be made by avoiding ill health through encouraging people to be more physically active. And also think more broadly, because there will be benefits in terms of air pollution, road traffic injuries, a number of different other benefits that come from people being physically active and being physically active in lots of different ways. And I, I think this comes back to some of the issues that were raised about terminology. Is it sport? Is it exercise? Is it physical activity? It's actually moving more, being less sedentary, moving more, and whichever way we need to communicate that message so that it's culturally appropriate, it rings true to the people that we're speaking to. We need to find that, that nuance, that language, in order to get this message across that really it's every move that counts. It doesn't have to be formal exercise or sport. It's walking because you need to walk, but it's walking also for pleasure because it might be a recreational activity that you want to engage in. It's this whole range of activities. And so I think we've had a really rich discussion and um, it's been so interesting seeing some of the questions and I see that some of them have been answered by our panelists as, as we've gone along so I thank them for that um, those responses that they've given to to some of the questions that we've received but I think the questions also reflect the breadth of um, participants that there have been to this webinar I think it's been great to have people from around the globe really engaging with some of these issues asking challenging questions and pushing us to think about some of these strategies that we need to develop and implement in order to get people more physically active. So really it's for me to thank ISPA for this opportunity of working with you as WHO to bring this webinar and these webinars, this webinar series that over the next few months that digs deeper into some of these allied issues that are, are brought up as we publish and launch a guideline. The guideline summarizes the evidence, it um, puts forward the recommendations, but it's how we implement these, how we support people to become more physically active so that they can gain those health benefits. And that's the really important next step. So I very much look forward to this series of webinars that's going to explore some of these issues further and thank all our panelists and all our speakers for sharing their experience, sharing their research and their work, and really prompting us to think about these things in new and innovative ways as we move forward so that we can do so much better. Uh, and when we look back at this, the next time we revise these guidelines in another 10 years time, hopefully we'll be able to go back and say, we actually did quite a good job in communicating them. And we have managed to change some of those physical inactivity prevalences that are so shocking uh, for all of us. So thank you again to the panelists and thank you Jasper and Isper for this opportunity.
you very much, uh, Juana, for your, uh, your excellent summary there and comments. And also a, uh, a slight segue to, um, to one of the things that I would like to, to share with you before we, uh, we are ending our, uh, our, webinar series, our webinar for today in a few minutes. Uh, and that is announcing the, uh, the next webinar in the series. As Juana was saying, this is a series of webinar. We plan to do this roughly every month. Um, as we uh, announced in December, um, where we try, as I said, roughly every month have a webinar where we don't plan to um, to present a solution to the discussion. We don't plan to, uh, plan to present the uh, opinion that we think you should follow. Not at all. We very much want to give. Uh, create an opportunity, give a, uh, may have a forum where discussions can be had, where we can talk about, well, where do we need to do more as researchers, as practitioners, as we've done today, we talk very much about implementation and there's a lot of work to be done. Um, the topic for the, um, for the next webinar will be sedentary behavior, um, which is um, something that is uh, relatively new to, uh, to the current guidelines um, and where one of the things that has been discussed very much as many of you might know is can we do we have enough evidence to set a threshold on sedentary time yes or no um, something to be discussed a lot more why do we call it sedentary time why don't we could just call it sitting some of the questions I also saw come by in the Q&A today it's one of the things that we will discuss more in the uh, in four weeks from now, um, keep an eye out on the on the ISPA website for the uh, for the registration link, um, and uh, and please join us for for the next webinar as well. Um, some quite a few people have been asking uh, about will the slides be available, um, and um, what we'll have done. We have recorded this webinar, and that will also be available through the uh, the ISPA website probably early next week. Uh, that will be available there. Um, and I think with that, I would uh, once more like to, to thank our, uh, our panelists, uh, Chloe, Jen, Adrian, Valentina, Juana, um, for making this, uh, this webinar, I think a, a very interesting one, a success. And I would also very much like to, uh, to thank uh, Nico uh, behind the screens, who is making sure that um, um, all the technical um, things are going well. Um, and last but not least, uh, Dr. Karen Milton, who has been very instrumental in making this collaboration between ISPA and the WHO possible and facilitating that and uh, planning the uh, webinar series. With that, I uh, lastly would like to thank all of you participants for uh, for being here. For some of you, it's, it's quite late in the evening or very early in the morning. We're very happy that you're all here and we hope that you um, that you enjoyed uh, being here. And um, yeah, um, we would be very happy if you could complete uh, the feedback survey. And obviously um, um, we would also be uh, very interested to, uh, to see you as ISPA members in the futures. Thank you very much.